Sam Gosling, and is there anything happening here? There we go, yeah. And I'm interested in the places in which we all dwell. So your living rooms, your um, offices, your cars, wherever it is that you spend time. And I'm really interested in how we leave traces of our personalities, both deliberately and inadvertently, in those spaces, and in turn, how those spaces affect us. Now, what you see here is uh, two dorm rooms. I've, a lot of my research has been done in student dorm rooms, and they're really interesting. They're really interesting places to study because they start out as identical. So um, I should say, these two photos you see here, they, they were not set up in order to be you know, interesting or funny. Uh, where, where, oh my god, what have I done? There we go. Uh, there we go. So those shoes really were there. They were, I didn't put them there as a joke. That's, that's where they were. And I just went into people's dorm rooms, and I went and stood at the same place and said, can I take a photo of your room? But what is really fascinating, right, is on the first day of the semester, the first day of the term, these two photos would have looked identical. You would have thought I was showing you the same photo twice, right? Yet just a few months into the, into the semester of the term, just a few months into it, they look radically different, and they look radically different because, because of the people who live there. Right? And so we leave traces of our personalities in these spaces, and these can come back and influence us. I, I, probably most of you are looking at that room and think, whoa, that's a terrible room. I would never live there. Except half of you are looking at the one on the right, and half of you are thinking about the one on the left. <laughs> so not only, but you, not only our living room, our living spaces, also our office spaces. So think about your own spaces. Think about now your office space. Think about your living space, and think about the items in it. Why is it the way it is? Here you see, in this photo, lots of traces of people's personality. Now, I think there are, our group works on the assumption there are kind of three basic mechanisms by which we leave traces of our personalities in our spaces. The first is what I call identity claims. Identity claims are these deliberate statements we make to the world about our thoughts, our goals. Uh, we are saying, this is who I am. So often you'll see people wearing stuff on their t-shirts or in the States, a lot of people have bumper stickers. They are trying to tell the world who they are. Here is a great example of some identity claims. So in this photo, you see all the person's awards, right, put up there, their, their certificates and all the things they've won and all their qualifications and so on. Uh, and, but where are they? They're behind where the person is sitting. You can see the person sits here, right, but these are all behind the person. The person isn't looking at those on a daily basis. You come in, and you meet the person, and the person is kind of framed by all these accomplishments, which is, and, and that doesn't mean it's disingenuous. Most of these claims we make are honest signals. They're things we're proud about. They're things we want to tell other people. But a lot of the things in our lives are about saying, hey world, hey other people, hey co-workers, hey others, this is who I am. As I mentioned before, we'd spend quite a lot of time looking at dorm rooms. This was the uh, door of one of the dorm rooms that we studied. And just think about this. This is before you have even crossed the threshold into the room, before you've ever met the person you're already learning something about this person and things that that person wants you to learn about. And it's not for the benefit of the occupant. The occupant's the other side of the door. The occupant doesn't get to see these things. So a lot of the things in our spaces are these deliberate statements we make to others, identity claims. But we can also change the world in other ways. We sometimes will change the world deliberately, but the purpose isn't to try to send a signal. So for example, listening to music, that's us changing the world around us. And that's to affect our thoughts and feelings, thought and feeling regulators, I call them. And so, you know, if, and you think about it. What you, you, if you're going to the gym, you listen to one sort of music because you want to be kind of pumped up and ready for action. If you uh, come back from a stressful day at work, then you probably listen to something else, something else to relax. And we also do these sorts of things in our spaces. So often you see, these aren't very good photos, but you see, look, here's like pictures of baby and, and, and things like that. These here are what some researchers have called social snacks. They're little reminders of, of p happy people, places, or times. These little things we have, may, many of you probably have something on your screen of your phone or a photo or something like this. It's like you're away. So um, in this photo here, for example, you know, this is the, obviously the, the occupant's kid, right? And they're missing their kid. And, and they're social snacks in the way that maybe if you've, you're at work and you're missing and you haven't had uh, lunch, you know, lunch isn't there, and you might like snack on some little peanuts just to tide you over until lunchtime. This is the same thing here. You're away from home, you, you, so you're missing your baby, oh, I'm missing my baby so much, and, then, and you look at, oh, and then you look at the baby, and it kind of replenishes your, your feelings about that, and you can get back to work a little bit. And so it works in a very, very similar way. Um, 
This, so I often, when I, when I give talks, I often go around and snoop around people's offices. And this, this, these are two faculty offices. So I want to show you these two here. So we have, a, we have an introvert's office and an extrovert's office. Which, what do we know about introverts? We know, ex extroverts, we know they love to be with people. They have, they, uh, uh, they, that, that, I mean, that's the real thing. They're drawn by the excitement of people. Um, they even prefer music compared to introverts that has voices in it uh, compared to, yeah, that versus instrumental stuff. So look, what do we know about extroverts? They like people. Look, here, look at this. People, 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 people. No more space, don't worry. People, 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 people. people. <laughs> and then look, the introvert, they have, look, there's a tree over there. <laughs> And there's a duck as well, I think, like that. <laughs> but look, but essentially, you're looking at these two different things, right? And this is just, this introvert's office is just saying, calm down, like <laughs> down regulate, right? So they're saying, hey, action, excitement, and so on. Okay, so these are two of the ways in which we uh, uh, identity claims, the deliberate signals, thought and feeling regulators, the things we do to affect our thoughts and feelings. Another way we leave uh, traces of our personality is through what I call behavioral residue. So we engage in a lot of actions in our spaces. We do lots of things, and a subset of those things, not all of them, a subset of those things leave a material trace in their wake. These are the sorts of things that you know, Sherlock Holmes is looking for, right? Sherlock Holmes is looking for physical cues of actions that have occurred. We are interested in looking at physical cues of ordinary everyday interaction, uh, actions. So here you see a uh, bookshelf. Now bookshelves have lots of evidence. You can see what the person is reading, you can look how it's organized, you can take the books off the shelf, what kind of condition are they in, the corners turned over, are they marked, are there kind of crumbs where in, the, in, the, where in the book where the person's been eating a croissant, whatever it is. There's lots of information here about the interactions people engage in. This was one of the uh, rooms in one of our studies. And here you see, Lots of right evidence. It's not, it's not evidence of action, but it's evidence of lack of action, right? It's evidence of not tidying up. Look, the Kleenex boxes are empty and everything like that. There's lots of evidence here of you can learn something about the actions that must have led to this space and therefore the, the, this occupant's personality. Now, here you go, that, there, that's in fact my collaborator, the introvert. See, that, there she is. So look. Here are some actions. So look, look at this. This is what my, my desk looks a bit like this, where you kind of do something, and then these sort of layers of sediment slowly build up. And then, but look at this guy. Look at that. Look, he's got all the pencils in the pencil holder. They're all the right way up. There's the staple. There's a place for the staple. And look at that clean office. You can see the great delight he takes in that. OK? And so, but the, they are different because they have different personalities, which result in different actions and result in different traces in these spaces. All right, so what I want to do now is I'm going to tell you about some of the research we've done. So this is uh, all based on a number of studies. I'm going to talk about a lot of studies. I'm going to talk about the first one in a little bit more detail because all the other studies have the same design. So what we did in our first study was we just said, hey, what can people learn about uh, people just from snooping around their spaces? What impressions do we form? Are those impressions accurate? So what I did, we had to prepare the spaces, of course. We had covered up their names. Uh, we covered up all photos of the person. And we had this choice. What should we do with the photos? Should we, because we know you form impressions of people based on just seeing what they look like. So we didn't want that, that to be going on here. So we said, let's just remove the photos. And we said, no. That's really important. It's really important the photos people have of themselves in their place. I want you to think now of the photos that you have of you in your spaces. Now, if I said, why do you have it? You'd probably tell me something completely uninformative. You'd say, oh, well, I like it. Yeah, I know you like it. <laughs> but of the 10,000 photos that exist in the world of you, why did these ones make it? And so it's really interesting. Do you have a photo of you, you know, meditating on the top of a mountain in India? Or do you have a photo of you, you know, drunkenly yelling at the camera with all of your friends uh, one night? It says something different, which photos you have of yourself. So what we did in this study is we just covered them up with post-its so that you couldn't see what was, you saw a post-it meditating on the top of a mountain in India or something like that. But you could see what was going on, but you couldn't see the person. And then I sent my team in and I said, I want you to judge these people, their, their personality. I'm, I don't know how to do it, so just go in and form your impressions, do whatever it is you do. And they're judging them in terms of the, the big five personality traits. Now, the big five personality traits are, many of you will have heard of the Myers-Briggs or the MBTI. So imagine the Myers-Briggs as if it had been developed scientifically by <laughs> rigorously, and you'd, and, you'd have the, and you'd have the big five. Um, 
So, um, so the big five, it's like the Myers-Briggs in the sense that you aren't just one or the other. Everybody has a score on all, on all five of these dimensions. So you aren't one or the other. You have a score on openness, conscientiousness, et cetera. And I'm going to be giving my results in terms of the big five. So what I'm going to do right now is just quickly go over them just to help you understand. And I'm going to be asking you to make some guesses ba based on this later. So be ready. OK, so uh, openness. What is open openness? So openness is people who like to try new things. They tend to be more philosophical. They tend to be more abstract. My, so my icon for this is Leonardo, of course, the quintessential Renaissance man. He was, you know, a, a philosopher, a biologist, a, 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 a politician, an inventor, a, you know, all kinds of things. So, so here's these people who like to try new things versus people at the low end of the pole who tend to be more concrete. They tend to be more conventional. They tend to be more traditional. I should say, neither one of these poles is intrinsically better. It's about the match between your personality and the environment that's really important. One very, very quick way to think about are you high or low on openness, when you go into a restaurant, you go into a restaurant and you open the menu, is do you say, oh, I've no idea what that is, I've never heard of it, I'll have it. If that is you, you're probably high on openness. If you go into a restaurant and they say, Here's an, I don't need to see the menu, <laughs> I know what I like, I like what I know, and I like spaghetti, bring me the spaghetti, <laughs> then you're probably low on openness. Um, okay, so my uh, conscientiousness is really about frontal lobe function. Uh, lots of my icons, you'll notice there's lots of 80s and 90s uh, movies references here, is uh, Robocop, who, as many of you will know, was half, ma half man, half machine, all cop. And uh, what this is about, conscientiousness is really about duty. It's the frontal lobe functions, it's the things about to planning, it's inhibiting your impu impulses, thinking before you act. These are the people who have, you know, organized desks. They are the ones who show up on time to appointments, etc. Uh, the next uh, icon, it, we, all know, we don't really need an icon for this one, but I have a Beverly Hills Cop or any character played by Eddie Murphy. These are the people who are outgoing and energetic and enthusiastic versus the introverts who are not. So one way to think, I mean, I know, you know, as Paul was saying, we can all learn to uh, enge engage in different behaviors and different sorts of personalities. We, and introverts will often learn, look, I have to kind of behave in an extroverted way in some context. I just have to do it. Right? But the real test of whether you're an extrovert or introvert is how do you feel after a party, right? If you are an, a, a, an extrovert, you, you, at first I tell you there's a party, you think, oh, great, a party. And then afterwards you say, whoa, that was good, batteries are full, I'm ready, where's the next party? Right? If you're an introvert, afterwards you're exhausted. In fact, you'll often go and hide, people you know, make some excuse, I need to go to the bathroom, and like rest, they just go and kind of leave, go and hide in the bathroom for a while just to get over from all of the stimulation. And, and it's very, very similar to what Paul was just saying. Agreeableness, so my um, icon for this, it actually used to be Mother Teresa until there was a biography coming out that said that she's sort of domineering and manipulative. So it's this uh, uh, character called uh, Mr. Rogers, who many of you may, you may not know, who was this American TV character who was just, he was famously nice. He was famously nice. In fact, he was so nice that he once had his car stolen, and then there was a story about it, and it was returned the next day saying, sorry, if we'd known it was your car, we wouldn't have taken it. So that's being pretty nice. <laughs> And so these are the people who are kind, sympathetic, warm-hearted, versus the people on the other end of the scale who are going to be direct. They're going to tell you what they think. They're, they're, they're not going to try to save, save your feelings. And then finally, neuroticism. Uh, these are people who are anxious. They're easily stressed uh, uh, versus people who are calm. You can probably guess that Woody Allen is, is the uh, icon for that. OK, so think. Go back to what they're doing. Remember, they're going into somebody's space trying to judge their personality on the basis of these f five dimensions. Which one of these dimensions can they judge? They also sent the team in, they're recording all, all of the items in it, so they're looking at is it, is it tidy, is it messy, is it colorful, is it modern, is it stylish, and are there books, and what are the books, are there clocks, are they fast, are they slow, is there trash, is it empty, is it full, it's all, all those sorts of, all the cues. Uh, and then what I did was I compared that with what the occupants were really like. And by really like, I, I got two sources of information. I gave the occupants themselves personality tests, but as we all know, we can all be wrong about ourselves, we can be deluded about ourselves, so I also got two people who know the occupants well to tell me about the occupant. So I could, had a very good gauge on what the person was really like, a combination of what the person says about themselves and two of their friends. Now, um, so here we go. So here is uh, your opportunity. So I'm going to ask you to vote, in terms of the big five, which dimensions do you think you can judge most accurately from snooping around people's spaces? Not just these two spaces. These are just two spaces to kind of get you in the mood. But generally, if you snoop around people's homes, which personality traits can you judge accurately? 
All right, and we're going to have a vote here, okay? So, so you're going to vote for one of these. There is an answer, all right? So get ready. Okay, so who's not going to vote? <laughs> all right, that's very good. All right, okay. So who thinks it's openness is the most accurately judged personality trait? That is 2% of you. All right, conscientiousness. That is 65% of you. Uh, extroversion. That is... Uh, 28% of you. <laughs> Agreeableness, that is 4% of you. Neuroticism, that is 8% of you, or something like that. Um, well, like you, like the people here, I thought what you'd really be able to pick up by snooping around people's spaces is their conscientiousness. And indeed, you do learn a lot about people, about people's conscientiousness. Your, your judgments are pretty accurate based on that. However, by far the most accurately judged personality trait from snooping around people's places was openness. That's the one that really comes out. You can pick it up, there's all kinds of cues there. Do they have distinctive spaces? Do they have diversity of objects? Do they have the types of art they have there? All kinds of cues to openness, and that is the one that comes through most clearly. All right, so we also did this same study in people's offices, and, and I, I like office, I especially like cubicles for the same way I like the dorm rooms. Essentially, these people start out with the same physical space, yet they put their own imprint on them. So I did the same thing. I had people go into people's offices, judge the personalities, and then compared those with what the people were really like. Um, now, the trouble with these spaces we go to, like, so this was one of the dorm rooms we, we studied, and you see here there's, a, there's a, a, a surfboard here. And the thing is, the surfboard is probably like a behavioral residue, right? It's there, it's reflecting their past and anticipated behaviors. But perhaps their decision to leave it out is also about, a, is also about an identity claim, saying, hey, everybody, this is what I like to do, this is who I am. And which is very reasonable, right? But what we want to do is say, well, what is the different role of these different mechanisms? I, do, you, do you learn a lot about people from their identity claims or their behavioral residue? And we try to think, well, is there something where everything you do is deliberate? It's not just behavioral residue. And this was in olden days, and some of you may remember this, many of you probably won't, but there was a time when people created their own personal websites. So they would just go and make and say, hey, world, this is who I am. And so we went and we said, well, that would be an interesting domain to study. And it's now, historically, it's quite interesting to look. For those, for those of you who don't know what personal websites, this is what they, here are some of the personal websites that were in our study. And so what people are doing here, so we, we did the same design. I had my team look at people's personal websites, try to guess what their personalities were like, and then try to form a basis. And then I compared that with what the uh, website owners were really like. Here you see, that's Carol's homepage. <laughs> Pete's Compendium of Knowledge. All right. And what's interesting about these places, they have lots of evidence. They have so much evidence there. So look, this person that you has their movie preferences, or in case you care, there's their schedule. You might want to know. <laughs> uh, look, uh, look, you even get information about the office. That looks like a fascinating person to hang out with. You? And look, <laughs> this person's uh, diary, they're feeling roguish and fruity and various other things. Of course, the cats. And then identity claims, right? This is what I said I wanted to study. I said I wanted to study identity claims. What is this? if it's not identity claims. In this case, it's the gay Hispanic frat boy, right? But, that's a, <laughs> but that is what the person is saying. He's saying, this is who I am, people, and I want you to know it, all right? Lots of information there. Now, unfortunately, unlike uh, the other study, we weren't able to get rid of all the photos, but, <laughs> but because we didn't technically do it, but that was one of the photos on the pages. All right, so, the, so um, we had people judge them. Now, of course, the trouble with um, these uh, websites is they're not very systematic, is that some people have better skills and some people talk about music preferences, some people don't or so on. We think, wouldn't it be really great if there was somewhere that gave everybody the ability to tell the world who they are and had all the categories and everything like that. So, of course, luckily, Facebook came along to help us out. And we did a study saying, well, what can you learn about people from their Facebook profile? So you, now, in this study, we did something different. Not only did we ask, uh, uh, we asked people to judge the targets on the basis of the Facebook profile. The Facebook owners, we asked them two things. We asked them, what is your personality like? And we got all of their friends to tell us what their personality, like as, personality was like as well. But we did an additional thing here. We said, what is your ideal self? What would you really like to be like? So my question to you, and we're going to vote again, is do you think people's impressions of you based on your Facebook profile, are they closer to what you're really like? or closer to your ideal self, what you'd like to be like. All right, so here we go. So who's not going to vote? 
All right, very good. So who thinks you're, if somebody looks at your Facebook profile, that their impression is closer to what you're really like? Raise your hand if you think that is true. That is 50% exactly. Who thinks it is what uh, you would ideally like to be like? Oh, that's uh, 60%. All right. Uh, <laughs> turns out that you guys are wrong. It turns out you're wrong. It's the 60% the, the are wrong. It's the, you, get a very good, you get a pretty good idea of what somebody's like, not about their real self, not their ideal self. Um, now, now there's not, I just want to very quickly talk about this guy, Talia Arconi, brilliant researcher. What he did was he said, well, another way we leave traces of our personalities is what we talk about. So he went and created a crawler, and it just collected all of these uh, blogs. And then he sent the bloggers personality questionnaires and just correlated their personality, the big five you'll remember, with the words, that, the things they talk about. And said, do people with different personalities talk about different things? And it was absolutely fascinating. You get a real glimpse of these traits just looking at the correlations between personality and their word frequency. So let's look at some of these here. So this is neuroticism. Remember, neuroticism, that's the Woody Allen thing. This is what essentially neuroticism is a sensitivity to what might go wrong in the world. That's what essentially what neuro neuroticism is, a sensitivity to dangers and fears. Look, what are they talking about? Awful, worse, depressing, terrible, stressful, horrible, ashamed, etc. Right? Look at the extroverts, however. Remember, extroverts are looking, they like people, they like opportunities, they're talking about, hey, bars, drinks, restaurant dancing, Miami, <laughs> shots, glorious, all those sort of things. <laughs> Openness, remember, this is the Leonardo factor. What are they? They're in their heads, right? They're all thinking about their heads. So, uh, folk, humans. Poet, art, universe, yes, universe, yes. Poetry, narrative, <laughs> culture, etc. You get the idea. Um, agreeableness, remember the Mr. Rogers factors, the nice people, oh, how wonderful, together, morning, visiting, uh, spring. There's porn here, but that's a, that, that's a negative <laughs> correlation. That means they're not talking about porn. Beautiful, staying. And then I know it's, I know it's nerdy for, for me to have a favorite correlation, but I do have a favorite. If I ever, I, if I have a favorite correlation, if ever there was a single word that captured a single dimension, it's this, it's like, it's completed for conscientiousness, right? <laughs> that means that you have a task, you have like, you have a bunch of tasks, you set out to do them, you've done them, and then you go home and blog about it. Right? <laughs> Remember this guy? Look at that. <laughs> completed. I've done it. All right, there are other domains in which we uh, express ourselves. So we did this study here where we asked people, what are your, fav your all-time favorite songs? Uh, and, they, and, and we took a lot, we went to a lot of lengths to make sure, and these really were, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to be funny. This really is somebody's all-time top 10 songs. Um, so what we did was, we, and we gave CD, we created CDs of the top 10s, and we gave those to other people and said, what do you think this person is like based on the, their top 10 songs? Can we learn about it? We know people talk about that when they're trying to get to know others. Uh, I'm going to tell you all the results at once. Then we did another study where we're looking at social life. So this is a thing called the ear, the electronically activated recorder, where people carry around a, a little microphone with them for, say, two weeks, and for every, every 12 minutes, it just comes on for 30 seconds just comes on and just records what's going on. And so if you listen to those snippets of social life, can you find out what people are like? Did another study just based on appearance. This was one, can we judge people accurately based on their appearance? They, this was a study. They did not know it was a study about appearance. They just came in. They said, hey, what's going on? And we said, stand over there, click, take a photo of them. And then we get their personality measures. And then we ask people to judge them just on the basis of their photos and compare that with what they said about themselves. Um, all right, so I've told, I've told you about a lot of uh, studies. I'm just going to give you the results here. Um, so some of the things you know. So these, these, the, oh my God. So uh, these here are the big five. You're very familiar with these. And these are the, all the studies I told you. Facebook study, website, bed. And the question here is how accurate are these different domains? We're using a blob analysis, which I invented, which just means the bigger the blob, the stronger the correlation. And there's a number of things that you will notice here. So first of all, some dimensions are judged more, generally judged more accurately than others. So openness generally is judged pretty accurately. Other things you'll know is some things are more revealing than others. Websites, look at that. Look, they, are, they were just really, I'm sorry, they don't exist anymore, but they were really good ways to learn about people. And then there are some things where there's a specific dimension that comes out well. So a good obvious example is if you listen to people's you know, social behavior, you learn a lot about their extroversion, no surprise. All right, so I want to shift now a little bit into, into the next uh, portion of the talk, which is saying, and that's talking about my collaborator, Christopher Travis, who runs an architecture firm. Now, he is absolutely fascinating, a hero of mine, 
Because what, what most of the research I've done is I, I say, well, look, here are the spaces people have. How do they adapt them? And therefore, what can we learn? What, what, how do people adapt the spaces they're already given? But what if you could start from scratch? And that's what Chris Travis does. And uh, unlike other architects, he really takes this planning this, uh, seriously about finding out the sorts of spaces people want. So he starts out. He starts out thinking, well, what is home? Home is not a physical thing. It's a psychological space. That's, that's what makes something a home. And so when he starts out with his clients, he doesn't say to them, how many bedrooms do you want? Or what kind of surfaces do you like? Or tell me about some other buildings you like. He doesn't even mention buildings. He says to them, tell me about a time in your life when you felt protected. Tell me about a time in your life when you really felt loved. And what was that place like? Talk about that place, right? And then he uses those answers to evoke a sense, a, a place for people. And it's really fascinating to look, at the, uh, to look at these places because he says you can't ask people what kind of a space they want. Even worse than n not knowing what will make them happy, they think they know. They'll read through a magazine and think, oh, I want my place to look like that. Then that would be really cool. Well, maybe but it won't make you happy. And so he's really fascinating. So we've done quite a lot of research with him just trying to understand the types of ambiances that people try to evoke in these spaces. So look, and you can you get a sense of the psychological feeling. So these are the plans, right? These are the plans that would be on the building site. And you see psychological concepts. So here, here's the master sleeping area and the, psycho the psychology that he's trying to evoke here is tranquility heaven. And this is Sarah's respite. Rejuvenation of spirit, master bath private and personal. Here's another one. So this is the master bath there. It says rejuvenation. But this master bedroom, different from the other one, says privacy, passion, and reflection. OK? So it's the, the emotions he's trying to evoke are front and center all the time. So we, I mean, he just does this kind of intuitively. So we try to study it more systematically. We've done a number of things, just trying to ask, what are the ambiances that people say they want to evoke in their spaces? This is the list of the top 10 ambiances that people try to evoke. Now, you might think, well, that's odd that welcoming is, is, is so high. Well, the reason is that virtually everybody wants welcoming somewhere in the house. And it's usually in, right, it's in the hallway or the entranceway or something like that. People, they want people to feel welcome there. Okay? Other things are less common, and they vary from space to space. So for example, this is the master bedroom, and this is the, uh, the, uh, t the, the top five ambiances that people want to evoke in their bedroom. Romance, comfort, relaxation, love, and quiet. And of course, these vary hugely across the rooms. I mean, it seems obvious, but like lots of people in our study wanted a romantic bedroom. No one in our study wanted a romantic garage. And you say, oh, of course, they didn't. <laughs> But that makes sense, right? Because that's a, it's not only the practical thing we're doing, it's also the, um, the, the creating the psych psychological spaces are important. And I think that this is what we do. So you can see if you, you can map these out. A set, where, where do people want a sense of family? They want it in the living room, the dining room, uh, et cetera. So this is where they want to be able to come here in the kitchen and the game room a little bit if, if, they, if they have one. Whereas if you look at relaxation, well, they also want to do that in the living room, but also in the kind of the bathrooms and uh, the, get, the guest rooms there. So, and I think what happens is this is one of the ways people regulate their feelings. They don't think, oh, I want to have a sense of family. I'm going to go and sit in the living room right now. But they just kind of, maybe they're just kind of, you know, at a low level, an ambient level, missing their family and just kind of drift into that space. And they evoke that and they meet that psychological need without really being aware of it at any time. And we do this all the time. So, yeah, so we've done a lot of studies looking at seating patterns. So you guys came in here today. Maybe the, the last people to get here probably didn't have much choice about where to sit, but the first people who came in did. How did you decide where to sit? Are there connections between where people sit and their personalities? And the answer is yes. So we, we, when in, these, in these classrooms that when I, I teach, I, kept, I record where everybody sits, and I know their personalities from studies we've done on them. And so we can say, well, are there patterns? And there are some very obvious patterns. So you know, big deal, of you know, hu you know, huge surprise, the people high on conscientiousness, where do they sit? They sit at the front. What about other people? Less things. What about the neurotic people? Where do people high on neuroticism sit? Any, any guesses? <laughs> they, they're right. They sit on the edges, right? Because they, they want to... Remember, what is neuroticism? It's a sensitivity to what can go wrong. They want to be, they want to be able to like, get out of there if something goes wrong. 
And in fact, we had the biggest effect. We had a, we had a, you know, a guy with a run around on campus with a gun shooting it. Uh, and the day after that was when we saw the real, we really saw the effects of the neurotics on the outside. So uh, supporting that. So I think we, and, but what's really interesting also, we saw some other effects. So people sit with respect to the physical space, uh, the physical features of the room, like the lecturer and the doors and so on. But we noticed something else that was really interesting, and that was that people sit with respect to others. So we found that over the course of the semester, the people who were high on religiosity began to sit together in groups and groups. The people who are high or low on, on liberalism or conservatism, they began to say, and I don't think, again, people are doing conscientiously. Uh, uh, consciously. They don't come in and say, where are the other conservative people? I'll go and sit with them. It's just they, they come in, and this kind of just place over here feels just a bit more welcoming. It just feels like these are my people. And we do this all the time. We want to be around our people. So I've done quite a lot of work looking at bars and cafes and finding out, OK, you want to go to get a coffee, where do you go? Do you go to Starbucks? Do you go to that kind of bohemian place where the you know, coffee's cold but really good or whatever it is? You know, and, you, and you want to be around people. You know, many of you travel. I travel all the time. And I, I, can, you know, I go into a cafe, and I open the door and go, these are not my people. And I go, then close the door and go somewhere else again. <laughs> and, and I think we all have that sense that we want to be surrounded. And if that is true, that means we should be able to judge a place just by the people who go there. And we, we've done that. So using Foursquare, we, we took the, the profile pictures of people who go to certain... So these are all profile pictures of people who go to a certain cafe in Austin a lot. Okay? That's all you know about the cafe. Can you tell what that cafe is like? And remember, look, it's quite a hard thing, because look, there's not always a picture. There's a dog there on the profile picture. <laughs> I'm not even sure what that... Oh, pumpkins, yeah. So, so the question is, can you judge what a place is like just from the people who go there? And we, so we did this study, and we asked them a whole bunch of things. We asked them, can they judge the vibe? Is it artsy, bohemian, clean, conservative, shady, edgy, douchey, et cetera? What activities would be good to go there? Dancing, read, blah, blah, you know, and what kind of people go there? Just on, remember, they're making this judgment just on the basis of the photos who go there a lot. They don't even know what cafe it is or anything like that. And it turns out that they agree strongly about what that place is like. And even more interesting, when I send my team of judges to these places, they, go, they really go to these places and then say, oh, what is this place like? Is it really douchey? Oh, yes, it is douchey. And then it turns out that just by looking at the, peop the people's profile pics, you can judge what it's like. And this is because we kind of, we're trying to sort ourselves into people like us, our people, people we, we, we uh, uh, connect with. And of course, you see a lot of now. Um, Bill Bishop has talked about this. He's saying that that's what happens. We, we, that we're divided. We're segregating ourselves in groups of like-minded people. And you probably think about that too. If I ask, I don't know Sydney, but I could probably say to you, tell me about the people who live in this neighborhood of Sydney, and you'd be able to tell me something. And versus this neighborhood, where are the, where are the kind of the cool hip people? Where are the, you know, whatever. I could give you various groups, and you'd be able to do it. Also, you know, Australia, like, you know, I spend a lot of time in Melbourne. A lot of people talk about the differences in personalities between Melbourne and Sydney. And we've done quite a lot of research, mainly using the state saying, well, look, because we've been collecting data, we have, we, we have mi literally millions of cases of, of uh, personality questionnaires that we've been collecting online. And so we know the personalities of different states. And so we can say, uh, you know, there are stereotypes, of course, right? There's the stereotype about the neurotic East Coasters, uh, you know, uh, as represented by Woody Allen, versus the laid-back Californians as represented by the dude from the Big Lebowski, right? And so is it true? Is it true that the, that the Californians are laid back and the East Coasters are uptight and neurotic? Yes, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, a, this is a heat map based on personality scores, and the red areas are high neuroticism, the blue areas are low. And so here's California, and there's the East Coast, and you find that. But what's really interesting is once you have these data, once you have these data of personality of states or counties or cities, you can link it to other things. We've done all kinds of studies linking it to health factors, uh, entrepreneurship, etc. Look, there's the neuroticism map, and there's the cancer-related deaths map. And, and if, you, if you do the correlation, it's a correlation of 0.70. Okay, now, I'm not, I, correlation is not causation. I am not saying <laughs> cancer causes uh, neuroticism or neuroticism causes cancer, but... They are related. Obviously, they're a very complex causal chain, but they are related. And you can, and lots, and so many other things. Let more, the disagreeable states have a higher murder rate. There, you know, all kinds of things I could talk about. All right. Uh, so, what, uh, what, person, what personality dimension do you think that is mapping? Remember, red is high, blue is cold. Any guesses? 
the answer is openness, right? You have the innovative people down the coast, and the kind of this is in the Midwest. You have people low on openness. All right. So why are spaces so revealing? That's the last thing I'm going to say. Why is it that they're so revealing? Well, one way to think about why they tell us so much is is is, is what I use is by using the stamp test here. So I'm going to ask you a question here, and I want you to answer. Okay. So who here carries in their wallet or has in their desk or something like that spare stamps? Raise your hand. Be proud. Everybody, look around. Everybody look around. Who does not carry spare stamps? <laughs> All right, everybody look around. OK, the truth is I don't care if you carry spare stamps. That is the truth. I, I don't care. But what's always interesting is the reaction of the people with their hands down, right? All the people who don't carry spare stamps are going, what? <laughs> and why? I've never thought of carrying spare stamps. Why would I do that? I, <laughs> And all the people who do carry spare stamps think, oh, what happens when you need to mail a letter? <laughs> and the thing is that whatever it is you do seems like the self-evident thing, right? And that's the idea is that, is that your personality is not just what you do, it's how you see the world. And how you, how you see the world gets reflected in a way that's very difficult to fake. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. I'm done. Um, see you later. <laughs> <laughs>